Okay. Okay, we're still rolling. Let's see if we can actually get this right. <laughs> <laughs> What did you do? Like sixty covers, fifty covers for Shadow <laughs> yeah, of the Bat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you how do you maintain a, a, a freshness and an excitement for for doing uh, the same title over and over? Well, I think uh, I think I had a real advantage with uh, with Batman because Batman is one of those characters where if you ask five different people to describe Batman, they probably describe a different character. Batman sometimes is just like just a muscle muscular guy in a suit. Sometimes he's that creature of the night. Sometimes he's the detective. Sometimes he's just a flat out superhero. So uh, it's really cool to do Batman in that I can do things that are a little bit almost horror and I can also do things that are campy and cartoonish. So I think I'd have a hard time coming up with 50 fresh covers on Superman, <laughs> but uh, but like Batman is a, is a character that, that has such a a wide purview that you can do a, a lot of really interesting things with him. Let's talk about some of those early influences. As a kid, you, you, you get hooked in the Batman TV show, then you you move into comics. Who were some of the artists that caught your eye? And did you know who they were? Because I remember as a young kid reading the comics and never paying attention to the credits. Uh, I didn't. Sad to say. I didn't. I didn't know, and and I didn't care for uh, for the most part. Um, but uh, but there's there's a handful of guys that really had a huge influence on me. Um, Gil Kane was, uh, was probably uh, one of the top. Uh, there's just, he was the first guy that I could, I could look at it and I could recognize, you know, that that style was Gil Kane. Uh, and, and I looked forward to going to the comic book shop, you know, sort of um, like I lived in, uh, in West Point, New York, and we used to always go to the comic book shop in Highland Falls. And, uh, and check out like uh, like comics and, and Gil Kane was doing like a lot of really cool westerns at the time and uh, and it was just there's just something about his style that the drawing just got me excited and uh, and I tell you something that's interesting is I was at Heroes convention uh, in Charlotte and the guy that puts on the convention knew that I was a huge fan of Gil Kane and Usually he does like a, a big banquet before the uh, the show, and we were all kind of going in and getting our assigned seats. And he said, "Oh, wait a minute, you're, you know, I was going over where the younger guys were, and this is like my second year in comics." Wow. And he like sort of pulled me over to this table with like Gil Kane and Murphy Anderson and all these guys. Wow! And he, and he sat me right next to Gil Kane, and that was like heaven for me, man. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I actually, actually got to got to hang out with him, got to be uh, friends with him. And another guy, which which is odd, because um, when I was a kid um, uh, at the uh, at the PX in West Point, we used to get these comics, but they were like, it wasn't like a comic shop. It was just the packaged comics, and it would be oh the three packs. Yeah, the three yeah, packs, and it would it would be two comics on the outside and a comic in the middle, and you had no idea. What that one, what yeah, what that be? one in the middle was, but um, but like, in a, invariably the one in the middle was always Commandy, Last Boy on Earth, and I hated that, you know. So sort of, <laughs> I I hated that book, and I hated Jack Kirby, uh, for the longest time, you know. Sort of so so I just did not pay any attention to him. I thought the guy's stuff was awful, but uh, but it wasn't until I matured as an artist, and then started looking at Jack Kirby stuff that I was just like, oh, okay, it's not about drawing, it's about telling a story. Gil Kane, I learned drawing from. Uh, Jack Kirby, I really learned storytelling and just making things dynamic and making things move. Tell me about your first uh, major job for one of the big two. Mm -hmm. um, my first major job for one of the big two was um, uh, kind of the coolest thing, but the most terrifying thing that you can imagine. Um, I, uh, I'm doing independent stuff, and um, again, the guy um, who does the Heroes Con, Shelton, asked me to do uh, an image for an ad that he was doing. So he told me to draw Batman, huge Batman fan. So I did this drawing of Batman, and he had to send it to DC to get approved. And when he sent it to DC to get approved, they axed it. They were like, nah. And he basically not only disapproved it, 
but wrote a list of what was wrong <laughs> with the way wow. I do Batman. And I was just like, whoa. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, Shelton sent it to me to basically say, hey, if, if you want to make some changes. And I was just like, ah, oh, nah, you know. So, so there goes my Batman dream, you know. I mean, I'm never going to do Batman. And, uh, and then uh, Dave Kraft from Comics Interview, who I was working for, uh, he started publishing um, this magazine that collected the, uh, the newspaper strips. Mm. And what was cool was he said, hey, I want you to do a cover, and I want the cover to have Batman, Flash Gordon, um, and all these other characters. And, uh, and I was just like, well, DC won't approve my Batman. And he said, well, this is licensed through uh, Warner, so DC doesn't approve it. So I was just like, okay. And I pulled out that list. And I did everything. Yeah, <laughs> Listen, I mean, it was it was it was me kind of going, ha ha, DC Comics, you know. And um, and what was, but was uh, good advice? Like mm? when you read the list, you said, okay, yeah. Mm? Um, yeah, yeah. It was uh, I, I saw what I had done wrong, but you know, I had an attitude then. So um, <laughs> of so, course, you're young, you yeah. know everything. So uh, so I did everything that they said I did wrong on this cover, and uh, and the cover got published. And what was really bizarre was a few weeks later. I get home, and back in the days of answering machines, uh, there's a voice of Denny O'Neill on my answering machine saying, hey, I saw this cover you did. I'd like for you to do some work for, uh, for DC Comics in the, uh, in the Batman office. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, my buddies are putting me on. You know? so, so I called every friend that I knew. And I was just like, come on, man. That's in poor taste. <laughs> you know? and, and no one copped to it, so I was just like, Okay, I'll I'll call the number and you know sort of got straight through to uh, to Denny O'Neill, and and you know that's like the shakiest, <laughs> most embarrassing conversation that I think I've did ever you tell had. Did you about the ad? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, and and he was just like, ah, oh, those guys in you know sort of um, marketing don't know what they're talking about. So uh, so it was it was so bizarre because like I am such a huge fan of this guy. And I'm on the phone with him, and and he's talking about like this job that he wanted Daniel me to Neil, do. I mean. Yeah, and uh, and I'm and I'm I'm really struggling to be professional, you know. But like, I'm just dying to say, oh, you know that issue that you did. <laughs> you know, it's like I just want to get into it so bad. But uh, but it was it was just just a lot of fun, you know. And uh, and that started um, my uh, my stint at the uh, at the Batman office. Tell me about uh, getting a chance to work on on Black Panther. Um, because not just a, a cool character, but a culturally important character. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's obviously uh, peaking right now. You get, you get the movie coming out. You have uh, the, the book that, that you've been working on with uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Yeah. Which, big seller and also a critically acclaimed book that really um, is probably the most critically acclaimed run for the Panthers since Christopher Priest redid yeah. him. Mm -hmm. Um, back in the, in the early 90s. Um, talk about the, 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 the opportunity to work on the book um, and, and why it matters to you. I worked with, um, you know, sort of Will Moss, uh, Wilson Moss, the, uh, on a uh, Jonah Hex story that I did at DC. And he was just a fantastic editor. We really got along, you know, sort of he was a, just a, uh, an important facilitator for what I wanted to do with the, uh, with the story. Um, and then a few years later, he's working at Marvel and I get the call from him. And of course, because it's Will, I'm like, yeah, you know, sort of let's, let's work together. And he asked me if, uh, if I was interested in Black Panther. And there's this, there's this real tricky thing where you don't wanna work on the character, on a character that you love if it's a story that sucks. You know, because that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's 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 heartbreaking because you you want to work on the story, but if it's just a, a a terrible story, then you know, sort of, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Um, so, what I started doing um, in the last, you know, sort of, probably uh, five six years, is not do stories until I've read the script or until I get the plot for the story, uh, and. I want to know that it's a good story before I agree to do it. Uh, and to a certain extent, that's not done in comics. And, and I've lost jobs because I wanted to, to like approve of the script before committing to, uh, to doing it. 
Uh, and were you worried about being labeled as like difficult and somebody who's tough to work with and, oh, and losing uh, jobs? I've I've got that label, so <laughs> you know, I'll just I'll just lean right into that strike zone. <laughs> you know? um, but uh, but like you know what what I what I want is I want everything that you see of mine is something that I approve of. You know I don't want to have a situation where I'm putting awful work out there and I know it's awful but I'm just putting it out there to get paid. You know, what I want is I want my best stuff to be out there. Um, and, you know, I said to Will that, uh, you know, let me, you know, let me see the, uh, the script. And he was just like, well, we're not uh, final on the script yet. And I was just like, well, who's the writer? You know, and, and my attitude is if I know who the writer is, that'll give me a gauge of what type of story I'm, uh, I'm looking at. Uh, and he was just like, let me see what I can do. And, uh, and, you know, hung up the phone and then later called me back and he said, would it be okay if we sent you a plot synopsis of the first, you know, sort of a group of issues? And I was just like, yeah, yeah, okay, that's cool. He sent it to me, I read it, blew my mind. You know, I was just like, wow. And you, you still know, didn't know who the writer was. Still didn't know who the writer was, but now I, I desperately want to know who the writer uh, was because this is something really different, you know? And, uh, and, you know, I you know called up Will. I said, "Yeah, count me in." You know, I I, I want to do this. And uh, and at that point, he said, "Okay, the writer's Tanahase Coates." And you know, that was that was it. I was I was done at that point. As the artist, what's the challenge in portraying T'Challa hmm? and, and and portraying him the way he should in a story like this, where his regal nature, his the the fact that he's not only a, a really powerful superhero, yeah. but a legit badass and an imposing figure. Mm -hmm. How, as the artist, how do you go about uh, bringing that to the page? Mm -hmm. Well, the um, the th the thing about it is, and uh, and and this this is, this is going to sound weird, but like uh, my attitude uh, once I got the script and read through it was, it's not enough to make him black. I have to make him African. You know, I have to go a l because there there is. There is that black guy in comics, you know, sort of uh, the fact that T'Challa and Rhodey and, you know, sort of Falcon and all these guys, they look like they could be, for lack of a better word, brothers. You know, they all have that sort of same black short afro, you know, sort of look to them. To them. And, uh, and my attitude was, uh, he's got to look like an African guy. You know, he's got to... Uh, really, I've got to do some different things with him so that people look at the character and go, wow, I've never seen someone like that. And, uh, and at the same time, the Wakanda was just as important as T'Challa, you know, sort of T'Challa's mother, T'Challa's uh, sister, you know, sort of, and all the ancillary characters. Mm -hmm. The they entire were, kingdom. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they were just as important and they had to be just as unique. Um, and you know, when, when you're reading the story, you're reading something different. And I wanted that first page to feel that way. I wanted you to open up this book and go, wait a minute, this is not the Black Panther that I'm used to. This is something different. You know, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Obviously an important movie for yeah. a number of reasons. Um, groundbreaking because, you know, the Marvel's first black superhero headline, the first black superhero to headline his own yeah. Big feature film, and it's a big movie. Mm, oh, yeah. Uh, huge movie, unbelievable cast. Um, part, you know, it looks like it's setting up the Panther to be a, a, a key member of the future of the MCU, um, but it means more than that. Yeah. Culturally, it's a, it's a moment, and it, and it means something. You saw when the ticket sales uh, hit, and it yeah. set records uh, at Fandango. Um, why, why is it such an important moment for the African-American community that this movie's coming out now? I think the African American community has been has been waiting for something like this. Has been waiting for. Uh, I mean, if you really think about it, um, this type of thing has happened before. I mean, uh, back in the uh, in, in the '70s when Roots came out. I mean, that was just a monster hit. But it's because someone decided to do something honest, but epic, uh, and people just flocked to it. Uh, and you know, as a, as, as a person who's like, wants to see black movies, yeah, you know, the, 
the Tyler Perry epics are good, you know, but but I kind of want something more than that. Uh, and uh, and the fact that Marvel just pulled out all the stops on this, uh, I think it's just got people uh, excited, and uh, and I think they they want to see. And and really, uh, I think Civil War really set it up because Black Panther practically stole Civil War. You oh, know, absolutely. That was, yeah, it, it was it was such a great intro to a character. And, and I think once everyone saw just how good they were treating the character, then people were like, we want to see more of this. And Marvel had Black Panther right in the shoot. So, uh, so I think, I think that's, a, that's a big thing. Uh, it's, it's when, when you really um, sort of treat the uh, African-American community well, they're going to respond. You know, you just, you just have to do great films.